OK, so that brings us into the presentation. So um, what we're going to do is cover off uh, very specifically uh, by to lab uh, this time, which hopefully you can now see the presentation there. So what I've got to cover off uh, will take probably about sort of 20, 25 minutes. Um, and then I've got, uh, well, really as much time as you want, but certainly sort of five, 10 minutes for a bit of Q&A at the end. So like I say, any questions, just pop them in the chat box. Um, and then as soon as we're done with the presentation, we can go through that and, and you can ask whatever you like from there. So if we get stuck into this, so just by way of introduction, so um, I see from some of the email addresses, um, some of you guys are clients of ours, some of you not. So just, just by way of very quick introduction. So Rose Capital, we're an independent broker. Um, in normal times, we've got access to something like about 100 different lenders and sort of 17,000 different products. So, so pretty much unfettered access to the market. That's probably down at about 10, 12,000 products at the moment for reasons we should explore in a minute. So um, if we aren't helping you now, we'd love to help you in the future. So um, if you don't have an advisor, sort of pick up with me at the end and we can point in the right direction. But very specifically for today, what we want to do is look at buy to let. Um, what I've got is a little sort of tagline there, sort of getting debt free faster. So. Our company has two very basic principles that we run by. So one, we want to get our clients debt free. And the second is that we're open on mental health and we can help in that regard because there's that inextricable link between your mental and um, financial health. But today we're just going to look at this very much from a sort of a debt free sort of lens. So with buy to let, naturally the, the actual property is an asset within itself. So depends what your objectives are. So if you're an experienced campaigner, you sort of know all this. If, if you're looking to get into it or sort of new to it, you might want to think about, well, is this just simply an asset I want to hold and realise the money at the, at the end? Or is this a bolster to my pension? So it really depends on what your objective is, whether you actually want to play the debt off or not. And there's a couple of ideas we'll play with as to sort of how you can go around that. So it might seem weird sort of me being a mortgage broker talking about getting debt free, but I've not met anyone who doesn't want to be debt free yet. And specifically in context of buy to let, you think, well, it's not really relevant, but it sort of is um, depending what your objectives are. So that's just um, just really philosophy that we run by. But what we're going to sort of specifically cover off is a bit of an update on where we are with the market, what's going on, what you can do, what you can not. So I want to spend probably the most time on that. Um, then how much you can borrow and how income is assessed. So um, income in this context will be the rental income. And I've got a few examples we can run through. Um, how to improve your credit score. So this is always a factor whenever you come to get finance. And I can hopefully debunk a few little things. And, and some really practical things you can do um, that has a really positive impact. How to navigate the market if you've got a complex situation or income. So really, really relevant with buy to let. There's all sorts of criteria, things that you're probably not even aware of. So I'm just going to go through a couple of trigger points that you sort of you may not be aware that you're complex, but I just sort of highlight if you are always it's never I'll go back to what I said at the beginning with every bank we can talk to, it's not a problem. The whole point is just understanding who to put you with. Um, so gearing, so that comes back to that debt free thing again then. So, you know, ironically how you can get debt free by buying more. And I'll explain a couple of examples on that. Um, and then have become independently wealthy in three easy steps. So um, it sounds like a real shyster sort of thing to say, but it, it's not that. It's just some really basic financial advice. So as I say, underpins everything we do and um, just a sort of simple little things we can run through. So they're, they're very easy steps. Downside is very hard to stick to and you have to do it over a very long time frame, over the 10, 20 or 30, 30 years. So. Right, so first point, um, which is really bringing us up to speed on sort of what's going on sort of post COVID. So. Um, lockdown started, I think it's something like the 23rd of March, and obviously that had a big impact on well, pretty much everything, but specifically in terms of mortgages. Um, unlike to sort of 2008, where the, the fundamental issue was there was no money, and if you're a bank with no money, that's a problem. Um, what we have today is really what I call a capacity issue. So banks have plenty of money, more than they've ever had on deposit. I think it's three to four times the amount of money on deposit. So, so there's no issue in terms of uh, liquidity in the banks. Um, but what is the issue is that banks really are not geared up for working at home, working remotely, and surveyors have been off the road, all sorts of issues. So the number one issue we had straight off the bat was getting surveyors around property. So as I'm sure you can appreciate, you know, particularly in, in context of a buy to let as well, is that the asset really is the majority of what the lending's about. I mean, your, your personal situation is a big factor, but the asset is really, really crucial in this instance. So um, what we found was, you know, there was a sort of week or two where things were very difficult. Um, you know, all surveys were put on hold. Some banks cancelled their pipeline applications. Some of the niche lenders withdrew entirely. So there was a re like really a week or two where it was just like, wow, how, how bad is this going to get? But then, you know, 10, 10 days, two weeks down the line, 
we saw banks really extending out what they call their AVMs, which is an automated valuation model, or sometimes called a desktop valuation. This is effectively an online tool to value property. Now, this has been around a long, long time. Um, and if any of you refinanced property or done your own remortgages, you probably know that most banks you know, do a very simple calculation. If they know that you bought your property for X, and in the last two years, house prices have gone up 2%, then they know your property is worth Y. It's a really simple calculation. So for refinancing property, it's been around for a very, very long time. Um, however, what we hadn't seen to, to the extent that we saw was banks pushing that out into a purchase space. So, you know, as I say, some of the really big lenders out there, some of the big buy-to-let players were really, really happy to sort of move forward on this. I think it was BM Solutions, that was uh, Coventry was particularly good. Um, I sat down there, came in as well. So they, they pushed this out into a purchase they've never really done before. Now, that does still leave a huge question mark with the rental property around the rental income you can receive, which we'll, we'll explore in a bit, bit more detail later, because obviously a, a property could be worth a certain amount, but due to its decorative order, it could be, have a huge impact on the rentability, also the, the configuration of the property as well, whether you have bedrooms, reception rooms, etc. So it's all sorts of aspects. So um, that was problematic and did remain problematic until about a week ago. But where we sit today, um, bank surveyors are back out on the road. Um, now, not obviously they have a big backlog to sort of clear, but fundamentally, all the lenders have come back to the market that are in this space. Um, but one thing that will remain is this online valuation. So again, if you're doing a sort of lowly geared refinance, uh, what a lot of banks say, well, actually, we're comfortable with the rental we can receive on the property. Can you send us the tenancy agreement or the bank statement to back up the rental income? And they're working on that basis. So, so that's going to stay for a good time to come, which I think is brilliant news because if any of you sort of seasoned investors or bought property over the year, you probably had the experience where a surveyor goes in and says it's worth, not worth at all what you're buying. You send a second surveyor in and they back up your valuation. So it's, it's very opinionated and, and that's just a human thing, isn't it? You know, one person thinks it's one, one person thinks it's another. Whereas these models sort of get around that and the sophistication is growing all the time. Banks like it because they're not reliant on an opinion or someone having a bad day. Um, and a lot of this, which it goes, which I won't go into any detail now, but a lot of this all sits within a sort of PI issue, so the, uh, uh, professional indemnity or an insurance issue. So what banks are doing is sort of saying, building these models with the right level of insurance, they're pretty comfortable, they know what they're leaning on. So I personally think that's a hugely important um, factor to come out of it. Um, one thing, sort of little caveat I've put on there is that the, oh sorry, so where we sit down sort of the, um, the loan to value. So as you can see, some banks even, I mean, I updated this slide literally this morning because what, a couple of banks came in um, doing buy to let at 80%. So you only need a 20% deposit or 20% equity in a property. And you see that it does get quite generous up the scale there. So, you know, you have to be pushing a million pounds before we have to put sort of 30% deposit in, which, which is really, really generous, particularly on rental property, which typically isn't up at that, that end of the scale. So, um, you know, the, the one sort of caveat I put to those maximum LTVs is that it is very aligned on the rental income. And I've got a couple of worked examples we'll go through. And I can just show you the wild variance that you get from going through different banks. But you know, really, you know, if I go through that journey in the last two months, we had a situation where some banks weren't lending at all and pulled out the market as to where we sit today where pretty much everything's possible. That's, I mean, for in banking terms, that, that's unbelievable. It almost takes years to get a sort of change to come through. So to do that in weeks was staggering from my point of view. So I was, I was really, really impressed how quickly banks did really up their game and get the market moving again. Um, so the next sort of thing is, you know, have they been defensive on their criteria? Think, okay, they're lending okay. Well, are, are they being really negative? Well, sort of not really. Um, you know, the, the certain things around sort of the, the qualification of a loan for a buy to let. So, so what most banks want to see is that you personally are financially viable. So you've got a job or you've got an income stream. You sort of tick that box and then you move on and look at the property in far greater detail. Now, as I sort of alluded to, there are lots sort of what we call the sort of more niche areas. So if you've got unusual properties um, or I've mentioned that HMO, so a house of multiple occupation. Um, so you know, that's typically, I mean, th th there's no one solid definition for an HMO, but it typically is a four to five bedroom house plus um, that's let out on separate basis. So you might sort of each room's let, so typically use student lets and that, and that sort of stuff. Um, now it might be a whole house or it might be configured into separate units, but um, once you trip into that, that rule and different local authorities have different rules, banks then sort of deem that as a separate thing from a normal buy to let. So you found that that and things like development finance, portfolio lending, et cetera, um, that sort of got pushed to the side because I go back to this sort of issue around sort of capacity is that you know, banks just didn't have the capacity to do complex stuff. So what they did is they stuck on the vanilla stuff, the thing that they can get through the system quite quite easily. But I'm not exaggerating, if not day by day, certainly week by week, 
there are significant improvements. Um, so I, thought, I, I, would, I would imagine, I'll, I'll touch on it a bit later, but I would certainly imagine in the next coming weeks and months, probably most things are possible that are possible before. You know, no lenders have been knocked out of the market that I'm aware of. Um, I've, you know, lenders are a bit more uh, cautious on what they're lending to and they've restricted their products, but no one's really, really sort of gone, gone out on this one. So, yeah, those little areas, so if you are looking at something a bit more niche, like development, finance, HMO, or doing something a bit more unusual, take a bit more care and we'll help you through it. But it's all possible. I've not had to say no to anyone yet, which I think is brilliant. Um, particularly if your circumstances change, you know, we ask, like, yeah, I'm on furlough, you know, can I still get a loan? Uh, well, the short answer is yes, because banks sort of look at sort of the furlough income or any other other income you receive as well. Um, so as long as you meet that lender's minimum income criteria, which is typically uh, an income of £25,000. So as long as you tick that box, then we can move forward and then look to get a, a buy to let mortgage. Now, there's lots of different rules around this, which I'll play with, but that's not such a big factor. So as long as you can tick that box or have a, a clear income. And, and, and that said, there are still banks out there we don't need an income at all if you're a professional landlord or you simply don't have an income. So one thing we, we see quite typically with our clients is that um, what we might sort of do is, and again, excuse for the, the huge sex, sex, uh, sexism about to do, but let's say Mr. works and Mrs. doesn't or whichever way around you, you'd like to place that you know, a partner, one works and one doesn't. What you can often do is then put a buy to let in the partner who doesn't work's name um, because then you get sort of the tax free allowances and stuff like that. So so that's quite common. And again, it depends on the lender, but you know, absolutely not a problem. So it's still pretty flexible in that extent. Seems to be a touch stuck. So um, next thing is sort of really around prices. So probably the, the number one conversation I've had this week, uh, because now things are easing up, surveyors are back on the road, deals are starting to happen again, um, is sort of like, you know, should I renegotiate the price? What should I offer? Um, always a difficult question for us to answer because, you know, I can't really give you solid guidance as to, you know, what a property is worth or what you should offer or even should you renegotiate a price. Um, but obviously, naturally, I'm not ignorant to that. So. What I like to try and do is just sort of where I sort of looking for my data is I look at RIC, so the R Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, all the surveyors that go on the road are part of this body, and they do a monthly um, survey to all their staff. And I'll put sort of some key numbers out of that of April's report. So do take April with a pinch of salt because that's the first month in lockdown. A lot of things were very unclear. You know, things are already easing up now. So I imagine in the coming months it'll be a lot brighter reading than this, but, but this is where we sit today. You know, the, the one thing that stands out to me is most surveyors believe that prices will be at least 4% lower uh, now that, than they will be sort of pre-COVID. So if you are agreeing sales, you know, you're probably going to go a minimum sort of 5%. But but then there's also the, anyone who's bought property previously will know that's not reflective of the price you see online. So you might sort of see prices online haven't moved at all. But then whereas pre-COVID, you're probably finding that you're going to have to agree fairly close to asking price. You know, post-COVID, OK, that, that price might not have dropped. But we're seeing people agree 5, 10, 15 percent below that figure. So there's some really, really soft pricing out there, which I think you can take advantage of. You know, I think the other key thing is that um, Rick's think it's going to take 11 months as prices to recover, which all goes back to that sort of capacity thing. You know, the supply chains and all the things around the economy, people losing jobs, etc. You know, what people are hoping is in the next year, give or take, things are going back to normal. So that just means conditions for the next year are really good for buying. So if you are in a position to buy, you know, Honestly, you really, really can take advantage of this situation. Um, one thing I thought was interesting was that um, even with all this going on, is that over the next five years, surveyors expected um, rents to rise by two and a half percent a year uh, versus what they think is sort of house prices have got up two percent um, per year in that same time frame. So that's interesting. So you're sort of thinking that the rental market is going to pretty much hold up, and, and it's always that, that that natural thing. So if people have lost their jobs and they can't buy, then they're going to have to rent. So it's logical that rent would be pushing up ahead of house prices. So again, it's all about that cycle thing. So being an investor in this market, um, really, really you are in a strong position if you can take advantage of it. Uh, next most asked question is, you know, rates have been slashed by the Bank of England. Have mortgage rates come down? Well, the short answer is no. Um, you know, a lot of what the Bank of England did was to counterbalance um, sort of changes in money markets, which we'll finish on actually. So I'll talk about that a bit more then. But, you know, Rates have come down a bit, just not much. So mortgage rates are still pretty much the same today as they were sort of in February, March, um, even though the base rates what 0.6 lower. So, so it's just something to bear in mind. Um, something, again, I'll finish at the end with, but I do think rates will drop toward the end of the year, and I'll explain that in a bit more detail. So something to think about at this stage is that, you know, do you want to buy a property now, but do it on a penalty-free deal and maybe look to refinance at a later date? 
you know, they're the sorts of things we're thinking about. I'll come back to that, but just to see that as an idea, we're doing a lot of that right now. I think a lot of people will win going through that process. Yeah, and then and then sort of the last most common asked question is like when are things going back to normal. And um, you know, I've had a little bit of a dig at the government there about sort of saying, you know, you know, got sort of clear guidance. Now it's easy to criticise because it is a phenomenally complex situation. So the only thing we're sort of learning out of this is that it's going to be very hard and it's going to take a long time. You know, go back to what Rick said, it's going to take a year to sort of things get back to sort of some semblance or normality. Um, but you know, I, I sort of think that the market will be working pretty much as normal, um, hopefully by the end of this year. Um, but again, you know, not to be negative, we just have to be mindful of things like a second outbreak and all sorts of things like that. So it's a little bit bumpy ahead. And the one thing I sort of put here, this is this is um, something said to me um, by, well, certainly the, the wealthiest person I've, I've ever met. It's a guy called John Hunt who used to own Fox and he sold it for, I believe, 398 million in 2007, which uh, tells you timing is everything. And I remember in a number of meetings with him and he always said like, everything is cyclical. Everything is just understand where you are in the cycle. So we're very much at the low end of the cycle. So if that's true, well, it's a great time to buy. It's a great time to take advantage of stuff. So people are overly influenced by recent events. So while a lot of people are thinking negatively, like worry about the job, the economy, etc., you know, a lot of people go into a state of paralysis. People who can or are able to can sort of push through those times. It's always the people in recessions, in downtimes. That's when people make their money. If you look at any successful person through history, they've generally come through a recession, done really well out of it. So. All I was saying, the property game, you know, historically is that fundamentally prices will go up in time, whether it's in line with inflation or more, who knows. But, you know, we're an island and the last thing I checked is that God's not making any more land. So, you know, invariably prices will go up above inflation. So understand where we are, which I think is a relatively low point. Um, and I think that bodes you well for the future. So if you sort of do want to run ahead and think, well, OK, cool, I definitely want to sort of buy somewhere. So how's the income assessed? So. With buy set, there's no short answer. Um, unfortunately, it's quite a complicated situation. So I've just picked out some key things to think about. There is a couple of variables I'll talk through. Um, I'm mindful of time, so I might do this relatively quickly, but um, oh, sorry, it's all come through as one. So let's just talk it through bit, bit, bit. So first bit here is sort of the standard calculation. So any of you particularly well read up, you'll, you'll understand that the um, buy to let mortgages aren't regulated by the FCA. It's actually the uh, PRA, the Potential Regulation Authority. Um, and what they've asked is they need to see a certain level of what they call ICR cover, which is interest cover ratio. So you can't just offer a loan like you used to. I mean, going when I first um, was organising mortgages as a broker, I think it was, it was really, really simple. As long as the rent was 125% of your mortgage payment, the bank offered you a loan. So, so it was really, really simple and quite easy. Whereas now it's different. So what banks do is, on average, they assume the interest rates at five and a half percent. So they ignore the rate you're charged, and that, that's our starting point. And then, because that's to account for things like interest rates rising in time. Um, and then what they want is the rental income to be 145 percent of that figure, and that's the ICR. So that's the the coverage, and that's to account for things like rental voids, downtimes, maintenance, etc. So it's sort of double covering it. So I've picked an arbitrary sort of hundred thousand, because then you can scale up or down depending how much you want to borrow. But you know, using that calculation, really simply, for every hundred thousand pounds you want to borrow, you need to achieve about six hundred and sixty-four pounds a month of rent. So if you want to borrow a million pounds, it's six thousand six hundred and forty pounds, and so on and so forth. You can sort of play around with that. Now that's tough in London. That's very very tough. So unless you're borrowing like a, a relatively small amount versus the property value, you know, if you want to borrow, like I mentioned, there eighty or seventy-five percent of the property value, that's tough. But there are banks are very aware of that, and there's a couple of things we can do around it. So. The most liberal calculation um, is going back to that old school calculation that I mentioned. So, you know, if the rent is 125% of the mortgage payment, so on that same £100,000, um, you know, the rent only has to be £259 a month. So that is a massive difference. OK, the caveat on this one is that your income needs to cover that loan. So as long as your income is about five times the loan you're after, that works. So that will work for some people, it won't work for others. But that's certainly the most liberal you get to. Um, so if that doesn't work for you, what a lot of banks do often is offer far more generous terms on a five year fixed rate, um, which I didn't put an example there. But what they tend to do is sort of take a lower rate of, say, 4 percent and then the, the cover rate can be as low as 130 percent. So it's, it sort of sits in the middle of those two figures, basically. So you want about sort of, th uh, sort of four or five hundred pounds a month in rental per hundred thousand. So it just sort of sits in the middle. Um, the reason the five year thing is sort of so prevalent is because the way the PRA wrote the regulation is, that banks need to cover the next five years. That's why they put that stress test in that's higher. If you have a five year fixed rate, that gives you certainty over five years, hence why banks can be more liberal. So it's a regulatory thing where that came around. 
Um, what we do a lot is the next point, which is top slicing. That is massive for us. Uh, we do this lots and lots with our clients because typically, you know, we deal with people who actually have a job, typically high, higher earners who have one or two investment properties. That, that's the typical makeup of our clients. Um, and if you do that, so what a bank would do is, is run that first calculation. And let's just, just pick for argument's sake that actually the rent you're going to achieve is £500 a month. As long as you can evidence you've got spare income of £146 a month to cover that shortfall, that's called top slicing. So your personal income can meet the shortfall of that calculation and therefore they'll offer you the loan that you want. So that's that's sort of been the number one thing for us to get sort of other loans through. Um, downside to that, um, it's just a sort of bottom note there, is really what some banks do is now if you're a high rate taxpayer, you can borrow less, uh, which is quite a perverse situation. Um, the reason for that is very logical, it's to do with the tax position. So whereas previously you could offset all of the interest versus the rent, as a running cost of the business, that's being phased out over the couple of years. I think it's only about 50% you can cover off now, and that's going to go down to zero in the next couple of years, which personally I think is disgusting, but that's a separate thing to get into. So, you know, you've got the 3% surcharge, you've got the non offset of tax. It's um, not Tory policy typically, but anyway, that, that's a big debate for, not, for another time. But like I say, not a straightforward answer, but they're some of the guiding principles and sort of the parameters you need to be in. So hopefully you can do your own numbers on that. Like I say, this, this is very much a, a sort of individual thing. So once we know your situation and what you're looking to achieve, we can help you through that. But hopefully there's some sort of guiding numbers there you can play with. So again, sort of relatively short on time. So I'm just going to sort of spit this one at you. Um, so this sort of notes really. The first thing is about your address history. Uh, this is probably the number one thing you have control over that can really boost your credit score. So particularly in London, you find that people move around a lot or live in flats. So just please do take a moment to go through your credit file and make sure your address is spelt correctly and in the same format. This is something that we fix a lot for clients and they don't even realise that we might go to a bank, you get declined, you fail the credit score. We look at your credit file, we realise that the address formats are different and we recondition it and get you approved. So just be aware of that. Obvious thing, repay your debts in full each month. Um, don't take payday loans. I mean, this is this is a huge issue, which isn't particularly common knowledge. I'm sure none of you do that. But if you did, just be aware that most banks will decline you if you've had a payday loan in the last 12 months and some go back as far as 24 months. And uh, whether that's fair or not is a whole separate conversation. And particularly with this environment going forward, I think this issue is going to rear its head a lot more. But unless banks relax their stance, that's just a rule. and It's just one of those things. Any late payments are a real issue. So particularly with buy to let, things have to be quite squeaky clean. So income sort of secondary, uh, very much as in your personal income, your personal situation is secondary. What's primary is the uh, asset itself and then making sure you've got a clean credit file. So again, doesn't matter if you had late payments or even CCJs and defaults, it's not a problem. We can still get loans for that. I'm just saying with like, when you see in the, the rates in money tables, all the cheapest lenders, this is for all the things they use to kick applications out, but then not a problem. Rates being so low, there's still an option out there. It's not a problem. Um, not having too much open credit, so what banks get very nervous about is that you can take a loan with them. If you have 10 credit cards with a £10,000 limit, they're all at zero, you think, well, that's fine, it's not a problem. They do get a bit nervous saying, well, you can take the loan with them and then rack up a hundred grand on, on credit cards. They do get a bit nervous about that. And for the same token, not applying for a lot of credit in a short space of time, not so much an issue now as it used to be, but it's something to be aware of. And also your occupation is a huge factor. So, so banks are getting a lot cuter uh, certainly around occupation than they ever used to. So, you know, for example, if you're a doctor, dentist, any of the sort of traditional sort of um, occupations, um, banks always look at that quite favourably because they're generally recession proof or pandemic proof as, as we're proving at the moment. So banks do like that. Um, let's say, for example, you know, a good friend of mine works in hospitality. You know, there are banks that are going to tweak the credit score to think, well, actually, that's a bit of a risk for us. So what you might find is you might not go to the bank you want or the cheapest, and it might be due to factors like that. They're things we can't control. That's just a particular bank taking a particular risk of you. Um, I think that also is going to rear its head a lot more in the future. So again, we can always get you a loan because some banks don't even credit score. They just credit checks. So as long as you've got a clean credit history, they're cool. So they're probably some of the banks we might have to lean on going forward. So how your credit score works. So, you know, what a lot of people get confused about is they've got a really high um, credit score, but then sometimes they get declined for a loan and people get very rightfully upset about that. But they're two different things. So a bank is looking at you very subjectively based on their experience, like your occupation, all sorts of things, exposure in a certain area. There's all sorts of things you can't control. Whereas a credit reference agency is really looking at you in terms of how many ancillary products can they sell you. So you, you, when you look at your credit file, it's always just like compare loans, compare credit cards, all those things. So, you know, it's really, it's more of a reflection of, of them selling you other products. So I've seen people with very low credit scores get mortgage and people with very high credit scores get declined. So, 
you know, it's very subjective, but they're some of the things we look through, which you can't really see on your credit for. They're actually far more important from our perspective. So what we tend to do is deal with is the actual data. So what we often do with our clients is get a credit report through, we talk you through it, and that can save a lot of time and hassle. So as I mentioned, if you've got a sort of complex situation, you know, there's, there's one sort of note I've added is, is the viability of all income is in question right now. So even down to rents and, you know, are, are you offering your tenants reduced rent or give them a holiday and all that sort of stuff. So they're really getting into that granular detail of sort of seeing what's going on, what's going on in your bank statements it is being questioned. I mentioned about certain job sectors being an issue. So that that's just going to be there for a while. So we just have to sort of get comfortable with that. Um, one thing which you may or may not be aware of is there was a definition around portfolio landlords a few years back. So if you own four or more mortgage properties, you are a portfolio landlord, even if you don't deem yourself as such. So you can still have a, a career and, and have four properties, which is quite common. Um, just means you have more hoops to jump through. And what you find is some banks pull away from this. They just don't do it. So again, this is another one where you sort of think, well, why is that bank going to lend to me? It's like, well, because you've got four or more properties. That might be a reason why a bank would say no. And we have to go to sort of more specialist buy to the providers. Uh, again, not a problem, but it just explains part of that decision making process. Um, the background is really essential. So, you know, things that are really positive in a buy to let sense are, you know, the more experience you have, the more track record you have is really positive. You know, and certain things outside, I mentioned top slicing already, you know, people with a very strong personal situation. So if you've got very good income, if you get a good, good track record on that sort of stuff, banks do look at that favorably as well. So um, banks are, it's not just as simple as it used to. Like I said, I'll go back to when I first started, I, I became a broker in 2003. And it was so simple. If you passed the credit score and the rent was 125% of the mortgage, you got a mortgage. It was as simple as that. But as you can see, there's just so much more complexity now. So you, unfortunately, you do have to be aware of it. Um, not all income is sort of treated the same. So as I mentioned at the outset there, so most banks have a sort of a, a minimum threshold of £25,000 income to achieve the loan you want. And also we've looked at sort of rental income and, and what a different aspect that has. So not all income is treated the same. You have to sort of think about it. So I've gone through the variance. I don't think I need to rehash that, but but just be aware of that. That's a, probably a bit more complicated than it used to be. The point around this being is, is please do get specialist advice. Now, naturally, I think that we're the best, but the reality is just be, be dealing with a broker because one, we have access to banks that don't deal with the public, and that's going to continue for some time to come. I think, you know, I mentioned about the, the issue banks are having, but particularly with buy select, there's, there's banks, it's a bit more complicated. They don't want to get involved in it. More so banks just pushing away from the advice process in totality. So one thing I would not be surprised to see as a sort of knock on impact of where we're at now is that mortgages become far more like being an IFA. You know, for example, if you want a pension or investment, you don't walk down the high street and do it. You speak to an IFA. Uh, mortgages are becoming like, if you want a mortgage, you don't go down the high street, you speak to a broker. You know, I spoke to HSBC, they think 99% of all their applications are coming through brokers right now. Um, other banks are 100%. Now, that's not going to carry on forever. But even pre-COVID, most banks were above 70% broker applications. So, you know, there's really, really a lot of things we can do. And you can see all the things that can trip you up on. That's why banks don't want to deal with that. Now, I'm probably going to have to do this relatively quickly. But um, just a sort of really example around sort of gearing and, and sort of how that can work. So this is sort of very much in context of getting debt, debt free. So... Say so as a rule, as long as I've done this job, we've always said that property in London, South East, sort of doubles every ten years. <laughs> it hasn't recently, but you know things like Brexit and COVID, they're they're big things. You know, we've had the financial crisis before that, but really from two thousand eight to twenty eighteen, we almost hit that point uh, until Brexit sort of scuppered it a bit. But so what I've had to do is just make some assumptions. So don't take this as a prediction of house prices, but I just had to use an example. So let's say again arbitrary figures again. So let's say you buy a hundred pound property, hundred thousand pound property outright. So fine, there's no gearing, so there's no debt against it. You haven't taken a mortgage. Um, if house prices go up by 5%, your property's worth 105,000, so fairly straightforward. There is also then the other argument. Instead of buying one property for 100,000, why don't you buy four properties with a 25% deposit? So 25 on, on 100. So in that, if you did that, so having four properties instead of one, with that 5% rise, then your gain goes up to 420,000 pounds. So um, that's then a £75,000 gain, not 5000 So that's that gearing argument is when you come to refinance as you build up equity in your portfolio, do you simply let it sit there or do you gear and buy more? So that goes back to that debt free. So what are you looking to achieve? Are you looking to achieve retirement income? In which case gearing is probably not appropriate because what you want to do is buy an asset and pay the debt off that's probably more preferable um or you might want to gear and then have a big capital sum at the end so you could really really gear and actually think well actually i'm going to build up a million pounds i'll 
cash that in and I'll buy an annuity or I'll invest it and I'll do it that way. So it depends what your risk appetite and objectives are. But but this sort of gearing argument is classically around buy to let. It's like, do you want to gear more? Do I not? What are my objectives? So, you know, as we'll touch on in just a second, like getting debt free and, and sort of basic financial principles, it's really thinking about starting at the end. So like, what do I want to achieve from this? Um, and then once you know what you want to achieve, we can advise you better. If you don't really know, fine, but, you know, it's no bad thing. Having rental property is a great thing because you're building up assets. But if you're really clear about what you want, you can achieve a hell of a lot more. So for this one, I'm just going to rattle through this one really, really quickly. So there's sort of um, there's a book I basically based most of my career on called The Richest Man in Babylon. It was written about 1942, I believe. Um, and it's all about Babylon being the first man-made city. Uh, it's about 8,000 uh, years ago that city was in existence. And they created money. Uh, as we understand it today, because they, it was the first sort of man-made city. So they had to sort of trade and create money. And it's just staggering. If you've got a bit of time, with, particularly as an audio book, it's a really good listen because it's written in sort of King James Bible language. So it's quite enjoyable to listen to if you like that. You, you also might not like that. But um, there's loads of principles out. And I just picked out three, which is like the first three in the book. And it's the first one is buy your own home and pay off the mortgage. So great. So this we're talking about investments here. But, you know, is your investment to pay off your own mortgage? Great. Right? That's part of the jigsaw. Save 10% of your income or invest for the long term. So again, this is very much where buy to let plays a role. Are you investing in property? Is it long term assets? Do you do it through a pension? You know, you know, do you want to switch into a limited company? There's all sorts of things around that. But the whole principle is taking that income out and reinvesting it, which, which I've sort of touched on briefly on the gearing argument. And then protecting your income through that journey. So there's no point being five, 10 years down the line and something happens. And you know, unfortunately, to be blunt, but you know, people do die, have cancer, lose their jobs, you know, all sorts of things. And, um, you know, what we can do is protect you against those instances, because while we can't stop that happening, what we can do, we can stop that messing up your financial journey. And that's very much what we're about. And this this is from a book. This is literally tablets that were um, translated 8000 years ago. I haven't made this up and it's, you know, it's, it's financial advice 101. I get that. But how many people really do it? That, that's sort of my question. And then also about managing debt as well. It's a really great story in the book, which I won't go into now. But you know, the, what they say is, you know, the, the point to it really is that you need to do all of those things. But if you're in debt, pay off 20 percent to pay your debts off and you need to live on the remaining 70 percent. That's the sort of, you know, you could argue that your mortgage is a debt. So, you know, are you sort of geared up to those sorts of um, those numbers? So if you stuck to that for a 20, 30, 40 year time frame, you'd be independently wealthy come retirement. And, and whatever your thoughts on the word wealthy are, you know, as long as you're like financially stable, financially strong, that's really what we want of our clients. And that's what we try and help you through this process. So just to finish off a little bit on interest rates, so I've sort of alluded to this a bit and it's sort of a good place to finish. So um, for this sort of stuff, if, you, if you're not a ra avid reader of our emails, um, which I'm sure you all are, but God forbid if you're not, um, you know, I do post them on our LinkedIn page. Uh, that's a really good place to go. We do lots of stuff on there. There's quite a lot of information, so it's worth looking up. Just to give you sort of a very, very brief sort of economics 101. I've looked at this forever and, you know, if you look at the thing, literally I post this every week and, and I look at it all the way through. So most people are familiar with this gold line here, which is the Bank of England base rate. So, you know, this is obviously coming into COVID, which I'll explain in a bit more detail. But again, this is Economics 101. This is, you know, apologies if, it, if it's oversimplistic or patronising. But what's really good is if these lines here are above the Bank of England. So this is five year money. Uh, this is two year money. So we look at this in terms of advising our clients, where's where's the money going? And then LIBOR is this silver one. So this is London interbank offer rate, basically the rate at which banks lend to each other. So if these lines are above the base rate, that's generally good. That means the economy is going forward, GDP is going forward. That's all great. Now, if it goes below it, it's generally bad. So this was no deal Brexit time. Remember, that sort of seems like a walk in the park compared to what we're dealing with now. But, um, you know, so it was like we weren't sure about the economy, what was going on. Then that triggered a second election and the Tories got in. Now, Think what you will of the Tories, but markets like certainty. We, they thought they had a five year run, big majority can do what they want, great. So we can sort of plan for that. Then obviously, as you come through December, January, news starts coming out of China, and that led us to where we are today. So um, the numbers there, so I've ne you can see that I've never seen these numbers converge as much as they have now. So this is basically saying that we expect one base rate rise in the next five years. So we're at 0 0.1 now. Money markets are predicting we'll be at 0.35 for the next five years. And that's pretty logical. I think it's made a lot of news today. I think the government borrowed six times the amount in April than they plan to borrow all year. And that really does put it into context of how much debt the governments are taking on right now. And the only way they're going to pay it back is by keeping interest rates ultra low. So that goes back to what I was saying about house prices. I, I think we're in a period where interest rates are going to stay very low for a very long time. Prices are soft. It's just a phenomenal time to buy if you can. So particularly if you're looking at investing into property and, and doing that sort of stuff, Yes, it's a really, really good time to do so.
Last I mentioned about following LinkedIn, that's how you can find us. Um, I'll circulate this all at the end. So if I come out of this, so I can see if you guys have any questions, maybe one second. Cool, so that's that. Um, so hopefully I've covered off a fair bit of ground. I'm not sure if anyone has any questions at all. Um, if you do, feel free to sort of pop that in the box there or um, sort of wave at me. We, I think you can put your hand up on this little thing as well if you want to ask any questions. So I'll just give anyone any... Oh, there we go, thank you. So Chris uh, asked, how does buy to let work if planned to buy auction? Um, excellent question, Chris. So basically everything's exactly the same. Um, all the principles are the same, everything works the same. Um, I'm sure you know how auctions work is you generally put 10% down on the day. Um, and then if you don't so exchange or complete within 28 days, you lose your um, 10%. So that's sort of the risk attached to it. Um, I've had many, many clients buy through auction over the years. So what we normally do is when you go to auction, the day before, minimum the day before you go, we have everything to apply for the mortgage. We get the agreement in principle in place. You get the lender teed up. So we have everything ready to go subject to survey. Um, touch wood and everything else here. I've never let a client down yet. So um, everything's exactly the same. It's just the the, the risk is that uh, obviously you've got 28 days to complete. Um, this is where things like bridging finance and things come in. So I don't want to get too hung up on that now. But let's say, for example, you buy a property that isn't mortgageable. You know, what you might want to do is take a short term loan purchase the property at a discounted price, fix it up and then keep it as an investment. So that's often where sort of bridging finance, short term finance comes into play as well. Just means you don't miss that exchange deadline as well. But fundamentally the same property specific and we can tee you up for it. So um, hopefully that clarifies that one, Chris. Any other questions at all? Oh, thank you, uh, Spencer. Um, is obtaining buy to let problematic for first time buyers? Um, Short answer is yes, uh, long answer is no. Um, so I'll try and give you a short-ish answer for this one. Um, what a lot of banks are concerned, I mentioned it a few times as we went through there about the, the rental assessment. So um, let's say, for example, you've got a big deposit um, and a small income. And what was happening was, so certainly pre, I don't know, the rules come as 2016, I think a lot of rules have changed. Um, what some people were doing was sort of putting down a deposit, saying, oh, this is a rental property, obtaining a very big loan and then moving in. So, so that's what they're doing. So what a lot of banks then would put a rule in place saying, we, if you're a first time buyer, we won't lend you more than what your income would afford in a normal situation. So about sort of five times your income. So to, to go around that rule. Uh, however, not all banks apply that rule. Um, and a lot of banks will take a common sense view. So, you know, so it doesn't apply for everyone. But, you know, if you went to the, the normal high street guys, they'd probably say no. Um, some of the main high street buy to let providers say no, whereas other banks will say, well, let, let's let's talk about the situation. It might be that you're living at home um, or, you know, you just want to invest sort of uh, tip, what we see a lot. I'm not general, but what we see a lot is people sort of living down south, um, saved up a modest deposit, but then can buy an investment property up north. And because there's such a big geographical distance, banks go, well, the fine, that's an investment. So common sense does play a role, but I wouldn't go as far as say it's problematic, but you do you do have to speak through. You can 100% do it, but you have to go with the right lender. Hopefully that answers that question, Spencer. Oh, my pleasure. That did answer the question. Cool. Oh, so Will, so you got a question, sorry. Um, bear with me one second, because two came through at once there. So Will said, uh, currently have a residential mortgage, but need to remortgage in October. We might be relocating, and if so, we'll rent the property. Is it better to seek consent from a new lender, consent from your lender, um, or pay penalties and remortgage altogether to buy to let? Um, excellent question, Chris. Uh, sorry, Will. Um, I would probably in that situation urge you to get consent to let from your existing lender, because um, there's no point breaking a contract that late into the contract. Um, it typically wouldn't make sense, depending who you're with and, and what the loan to value is and other stuff like that. What, what you, again, I'm, I'm very much generalising here, but let's say, for example, you've got more than about 15, 20 percent equity in the property and you've lived there more than six months or so. The majority of lenders give consent to let without any real hassle. So um, if you want to talk specifics, drop me a note and I'm happy to talk you through it after. But, um, but generally, most banks are, are pretty flexible on that. Uh, Chris, you said, if the property is being purchased and is needed refurbishment expansion, can you get a larger buy-to-let mortgage or is it better to find alternative funds to build and then remortgage to release cash? Um, great question, Chris, actually. Um, so this is where you're sort of getting into sort of development refurb sort of stuff. So um, depending on the level of where, if it's purely cosmetic, there are a couple of banks that will, they sort of do, um, 
called a retention. So they'll offer, say, 75% of the property that you buy day one, but then on the revaluation might release a bit more money later. So you can do that. Um, some banks work on what's called the open market value. So if you're buying a really dilapidated property, you say, well, actually, I'm getting this as a massive bargain, but it's worth a lot more than what I'm buying it for. You can sort of do it that way. Um, and then you get right out into the realms of sort of bridging finance where they sort of think, well, actually, we'll lend you X amount of money now. And they do staged advances. So, so once I've done a new kitchen, bathroom, we do that. I'm going to do an extension. I'm going to do a loft. They might release extra money as you go. Uh, at, the, at the very far end of the spectrum is, is pure development finance. So you think, well, here's a property. I'm literally going to cut it up into four flats and extend it all out, do a load of work. Um, all of those things are possible. So it really depends on your level of work and what you're doing. So if it's very light refurbishment, you'd find that some of the high street guys will offer you a loan. If it's beyond refurbishment into a bit of structural work and a bit of extensions, you're probably going to deal with someone a bit more specialist, but it's very specific to the property and what you want to do. Um, cool, noted. Well, I think you've got my email, so I think, um, yeah, if you feel free to drop me a note um, if you want to talk about that in a bit more detail. OK, brilliant. Well, that's that's actually gone on quite a long time, actually. But as you were asking questions, I felt it was worth carrying on. Um, unless there's any more questions, I think we'll look to wrap that up. So I think we're done on that. Cool. Right. So again, um, thank you very, very much for spending the time going through this. Hopefully it's been helpful. I'll um, circulate the notes after this. And as I say, if you're working with us, fantastic. If you're not, you know, feel free to drop me a note. Um, me and all my advisors details on the website. So, you know, look us up and we'd love to help you sometime soon. So if I don't speak to you guys, we'll have a fantastic weekend and we'll catch up soon.